Evening coaches, uh, welcome to the Locker Room Podcast, two familiar faces tonight again, Daniel St. Ledger and Turlico Brian. very welcome gentlemen, uh, just while I have you lads, there's a wee story sort of came into my head there, I was thinking about it today, uh, you know, when the National League kicked off there, uh, you know, I was just thinking Turlock actually back to, I think it's eight years since I first met the boys down the road with Carlo, I think in 2016, and just thinking about the National League, you know, and, and how every game, it, it actually, I think it's our best competition, Turlock. I really think it's our best competition. And I remember the days where we were traveling to Limerick, traveling over to London, you know, going across to Leitrim in the bus. Like, and they're brilliant days, you know, and it's a week to week basis. And it's what players, coaches, and supporters want, Turlock, isn't it? Really, like, it's great to have the competition back, isn't it? Absolutely. I think the whole of the GA world was delighted to be back in action on Sunday. It's great to be following the other games as well as you're at a game and you're watching the score lines and who's going well, who isn't going well, and you're listening for stories and counties having a good time, you know, good preparations. Or, it's all part of it, you know, and uh, the, the, the continuity of the games is, is the most important thing, though. It really gives real momentum to teams. And, you know, the trend to games ratio thing is obviously the thing that, that annoys most people. You know, you're involved with a team, it's your training, 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 you don't get enough games. So National League gives you those games. Fortunately, probably a little bit too early in the year. You'd like to have it in better weather. Yeah. And Leds, the crowds were up and, you know, the football as well. It's been all doom and gloom from a football perspective. People are, are, are criticising football and how negative football is. But really and truly, the football over the weekend was was pretty much of a high standard. And and probably the, the league final or the club final, sorry, last weekend was a nice lead into the National League this week. Some, some great games, Daniel. Yeah, I kind of was in club mode really until last week. I hadn't even thought about the league until I think we mentioned on the podcast and it kind of caught me in the hop that it was coming up so fast, you know, it kind of creeps up on you. But no, I thought I thought it was decent. Any Anything that was visible on you was decent. You know, I mean, obviously we only get to see limited amounts of games just because of coverage and this and that. But I think anything we saw was pretty good. Um, I, the, the, as Turlo said, the weather ruins it. Like, geez, the wind makes up all the games. It really does, you know, and, and it's very hard to... It's very hard to analyze too much. Like you'd love to really get stuck into, you know, the the division one games, division two games, and and seeing what's happened, and patterns and stuff. But because of the time of year and because everyone's probably has a different motive from the for the league, especially the higher up the divisions go. Like some teams are <laughs> have no major interest in in winning the league and kind of just want to get through without injuries and use it for conditioning. Other teams. Like and I think they're I think it's fairly clear who some of those teams were. Like you look at Cavan, look very sharp. Tom Mayo look very sharp. Some of these teams who are clearly targeting a good league run, and it's it's probably very different in the top couple of divisions as opposed to down in the basement. Like as we know, your your league is your championship, and you have to be pacing for the end of January. You know, and that's probably the one non-negotiable for Division Four teams. Like you really can't afford to kind of take your time and get into it. And you know, it's funny we were talking about the the run of games and the momentum. In Division 1, 2 and 3, the league is competitive until the end because you can be either going up or you can be going down. Whereas in Division 4, if you don't get off to a good start in Division 4, that's your league done. And you could end up, if you have three games and you have three losses in the first three, that's your that's your year, your league year pretty much done. And, and ultimately, you could probably say your year done. So the the, the pressure is on the teams in, in 4. Like I mean, those first couple of games for, for the teams in 4 is, is ferocious, like it really is. But... Um, yeah, overall, I, I, I enjoy watching the games, and I think that's yeah. I think that's the bottom line, you know. That's an inter- interesting edge because obviously Turlock, you know, you, you know, having been involved with, with Carlo as a senior manager, Carlo, like you obviously understood the importance of league because league was everything, you know. And then a championship run was was a bonus. And to go to Ledge's point there, like Kerry went out against Derry on Saturday night with seven <laughs> of the team playing that played in the All Ireland semi final. Derry had thirteen of the team playing that played in the All Ireland semi final, including the three Glen lads who who only six did earlier. Had, had played in an All Ireland final. I know there was a big hooray about those lads playing Turlock, but for me, you know, you've got Kieran McFall who can back, obviously, due to circumstances even in America for a while, and he came back last year in the middle of the season. So he didn't get a full season with Derry. It's a new management team, so he's obviously keen to play. Ethan Doherty's young player of the year. He's still a young guy, Ethan Doherty. Uh, you know, again, probably wants to impress in front of a new manager. And Connor Glass is the captain of the senior team in Derry, you know. So, like, it's probably no major surprise they played Turlock, you know, in, in my opinion. like, And probably Turlock as well. Football has changed from from even when you were playing or you were managing years ago in that, you know, and led you as well. We all enjoyed a pint or two after a match or a beer or two. Like, but a lot of young lads now, and particularly these younger brand of footballers, they're not big heads heavy drinkers, they're not into three, four day benders, they're looking after their bodies, you know, they understand the importance of it. And I suppose Turlick on Saturday night, 
Kerry have that luxury of shadow boxing, you know, and Dublin the same. And and like, how did you see Kerry and Derry Fern? And did and was this was the scoreline a surprise to you? Yeah, well, look, I suppose you know you say Kerry like you know probably the a, a more casual approach to the game than Derry like, but same time Kerry won't want to be caught in a relegation back into this uh, league campaign, you know. Um, so you can't afford really dropping points in home games. Um, and actually, there's a lot of away wins at the weekend. Uh, most most wins were away. And, you know, Derry, a team on the up. Uh, momentum is massive for them. And they don't want to lose any of that momentum because the resting three lads played an hour in the club final. They want them all on board and they want to, they want to put up the strongest team. And, and those players want to play as well. And they're so well conditioned. And in fairness, you know, the, the, the whole professionalism in the background will make sure that these guys are rested and recovered. Yeah. Between games, you know, those guys won't be, you know, the one you all heard in club final. But I saw I saw a photograph of a few of them together, and there was Conor Glass in his cycling gear. <laughs> he was going out for a cycle, you know. Uh, the week the week they were supposed to be celebrating, but they all, they all heard in success. And here he is, then you know, down in down in down in Turner Turner be, days might, as well. No, but Turnick, he might be you sort of set a fashion trend with the cycling, so so Connor might be sort of wearing that as a fashion garment. Do you know what I mean? He might be they're on a pub crawl, I think it's the same way to get around. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but t- tell me, tell me this, Ledge on, on the game itself, like you know, Derry every time Kerry is spotted now, obviously at 11 7, 11 6, you're sort of thinking, uh, the game's gone away from Kerry, you know, and then obviously the the, the evolution of of Owen Lynch coming out the field, they were actually caught a few times, and I know it was that sort of a night where the weather was windy it was sticky any any sort of ball that wasn't directly the hand was going to be in the ground there was going to be rocks there was going to be mauls but the goal that Kerry got obviously was very sloppy from a dairy point of view but then just every time Kerry responded with a goal or a major score Derry just went into that slow control mode of controlling the game by their time and they always seemed to be able to work a score from a really really good structured attack and that's something obviously Daniel that has been coached now for the last two to three years in Derry like yeah, it's um, it, it probably is telling that the lads played the ten lads played. I think because we mightn't, maybe the outsiders mightn't realize it. But probably going to Kerry and getting a win in Tralee is probably a big deal for this Derry team. Like you have to consider where they're coming from as well. And I remember the they were talking about the England World Cup team rugby two thousand three, and it was until they won in the Southern Hemisphere they weren't ready. They weren't ready to win the World Cup. And the year before they won the World Cup two thousand three, they won in the Southern Hemisphere. And it could right. be a psychological thing that they feel yeah. like. Like, Tralee is a bear pit, you know? I mean, there, yeah, were, there was no... Yeah. It wasn't too soft at the weekend, like, I tell you that much. It, it was hot and heavy at times, but there, look, Derry were the better team, and ultimately, I think they were a bit more efficient, and the goals probably kept Kerry in it, but at the same time, Stephen O'Brien probably should finish uh, one-on-one opportunity, he tries to, tries to get a six-pointer, and he should have just slotted into the corner. Could have been a totally different game, so... It, it actually, I, I think it was a huge risk from the sense... Whatever about physically and everything else, as I said, the... The, the new breed of player are different. You know, I, I know at our own lads up here in Sylvester's, like you'd be trying to force them to go for a couple of points and, you know, it's hard, it's hard to convince them. Sometimes. I wouldn't force you, Daniel, anyway. But for listen, I just want to keep the boys happy. Like, but <laughs> it's, um, it, it is a, a new breed. So from, from a physical point of view, there'd be no issue. But I think it was a big, it was a big call for Mickey Hart because 13 of your All-Ireland final team, if you go down and lose to a Kerry team, having pretty much put all your eggs in that basket, that puts you under a little bit of the cost. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? It, it's yeah. not a fantastic game. So it was probably a big win from Derry, like Derry's point of view psychologically, I think. Um, as regards to the quality of the game, yeah, I, I thought I thought Derry were probably the better team overall. I thought Kerry looked relatively all right. I think they looked sharp enough considering the, the like, you know, seven of their, their all Ireland team. Um, but it, it was it was attritional. And we've seen keepers this weekend. I mean, how many goal chances have we seen? Like we saw from Donegal, Patton got caught out. We saw, yeah. you know, we, we saw in, the, in Kerry the same. Like, it's, Na- it's, Niall Morgan it's not the weather for it. Like, Niall Mor- yeah. Yeah. like, it's not the weather for keepers this time of year. And yeah. as you know, I was, I was talking to, I work with, with, with Lux, and we were chatting about this, and we were chatting about the evolution of keepers. And sometimes there's such a copycat mentality in the GA. It's just like, well, if one keeper goes out, we all have to do it. But, like, yeah. you, go up to, you go up to our man, look at Ethan Rafferty. He's the prototype because he's actually an outfield player. He might he mightn't be as efficient in other goalkeeping areas, but as a goal as a as a footballer, he's brilliant at it. And now yeah. he's every keeper trying to do it, even though it mightn't suit their skill set. You know, so it's it's interesting. I think the goalkeeper one is still going to cause a bit of a ripple debate, and ultimately, ultimately, that nearly that nearly cost Derry the weekend. But um, I I thought it was a ripping game, just yeah. hot and heavy. The quality mightn't have been amazing, but it was it was fairly tough. 
and and Turlock, a man that you've you know come up against on the sideline in the past too, Mickey Hart, obviously, uh, you know, a long, long standing rivalry with Kerry, you know, partially for Mickey stretching, stretching over two decades, going back as far as two thousand and three when. When that sort of famous, you know, incident and in, in, under the Hogan stand where where Mickey's throne went up and and you know as Daniel talked about that psychological win of of beating Kerry and funny you know when you when you read Mickey's books as well Turlock you know he places a huge emphasis on the psychological aspect of you know going down to Kerry McGuinness was the same boys with Donny Gall you know going down and the Kerry boys think we're soft and you know we think we're party boys and changing that mindset and that mentality and how much do you think even personally Turlock you know that that was obviously a huge one for Mickey on Saturday night like you know from a person perspective Mickey Hart's philosophy really is to try and win every game look yeah. you he approaches the McKenna Cup every year and he wants to win every game they play and when he's with Tyrone going to Kerry and winning in Kerry gave them the real self-belief and confidence that needed later on when they played him in the Ireland Championship and that's the approach he's taken here with Derry and yeah. his own personal perspective I'd say you know there's a lot of I suppose coverage about him Moving to moving to Derry as manager and as Tyrone, you know, as a Tyrone icon going into Derry and uh, would he be accepted? Would he not be accepted? Would he flick with the players? Well, it was a big match for him, you know. It was a big, big match, and to get yeah. a to get a win was really important for him, you know. And I think, I think he's he's look, he's a, his track record is phenomenal, and he's just going to continue on with Derry, you know. He's 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 there for one reason, just to win an All Ireland, and that's that's where he's going. Yeah, hopefully he goes into the right changing room next weekend then in Sally Park when Trone travelled to <laughs> travel to Derry. Hopefully he doesn't get mixed up. But uh yeah, no, I suppose look, like I don't think Daniel there's any danger. I know Turlock talked about Kerry getting sort of sucked in and, and there is look they go to Monaghan next week. Kerry go to Monaghan next week, obviously it's a difficult game for them, but I still think, you know, when the Cliffords come back in a couple of weeks' time, they'll pick up those three to four wins, I think, in their last four or five games. Daniel, would you would you be safe enough in saying that, will you? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I look, come here, going, going down to Division Two is not the end of the world, as Dublin found out. Uh, Dublin found out last year, but it's um, yeah, I'd, I'd imagine they're all right. I actually, I thought, I thought all things considered, I th- and and I thought Derry were Derry were looking fairly hot in the McKenna Cup as well. They look really organised. Continuation from last year, and all things considered, I thought Kerry were pretty were, were pretty decent. It, it, the the home game factor definitely is a, an element there that that I'm sure they're not overjoyed to be losing home games, but. I think they have enough. I think they have enough to be okay. Like I think there's probably a couple of teams. I think Ross Common might be under a little bit of pressure. Tyrone maybe the same. You know that was a big game as well. The weekend whoever won that one is kind of getting a bit of a head start in it. But I'd imagine I'd imagine Kerry will be fine. And when when they need the when they need to make the call and need a couple of wins, they'll they'll give the boys a shout. And I'm I'm sure like that's worked. Like they, like the two Clippers alone could be worth six seven scores. You know so that's um that's 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 big at this time of year. You know. Yeah, and Turlock, Tyrone, Roscommon, Daniel mentioned, I suppose moving on to Tyrone, Roscommon, uh, you know, Dara Canavan, a sensational display. Uh, as as a man would say here in the North, he didn't lick it in the street. There's DNA yeah. there, I think, somewhere. I was, I was really impressed there with Tyrone. Uh, all the young guys played very, very well. I did six dividends there in, in that yeah. match. You know, typical Tyrone football, like they moved the ball really, really well and movement was fantastic and it was it was refreshing to see it from Tyrone because they have been struggling and you know getting that win. Russ Common, you know, had a very good league last year and um you know probably fancied their chances you know last Sunday. And I just think I think Tyrone might actually surprise a few teams before this league is over. Um I'm sure I'm very impressed with them. Yeah, well, the asset, the asset and, test, the asset test ledge is next weekend, obviously in, in in Celtic Park. But you know, as as Turlock talked about the younger boys from Toronto, I was talking to Jody Gormley this morning. We played a schools match. Jody was at the match. He's the Trillick manager. Uh, two young lads from Trillick made their senior debut up alongside Canavan yesterday. And you know, you heard Darren Canavan talking about them after the match and how impressed they were. Toronto always play or always produce really good footballers, man. Right? They're they're they they were in three of the Toronto school teams, under eighteen teams. We're in the McCrory Cup semi-finals last year. The three Tyrone, different Tyrone schools, St. Joseph's done it more, uh, Dungannon this year, uh, Oma, you know, they're historically producing good underage teams, good school structures. Like some of the calibre boys of the teachers in those schools, like Canavan and Trinity, Keir McGeary, you know, um, for Mana manager, Kieran, uh, Jesus, his name's going out of my head here, but Kieran Donnelly, mm-hmm. Kieran Donnelly up in Oma. You know, these men are top, top operators operating in the schools and that can only be, Daniel, a massive advantage for the development of football in Toronto next year, to God. Yeah, absolutely. And I was, you know, talking about the new lads that came in. I thought Shawnee Donnelly was, 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 was well, Sean Donnelly was really, really good. Like he, he, I think he reminds me of a young Darren McCurry, the way he moves and everything. Yeah. And he's just so comfortable on the ball. And they all have, 
Uh, I know you would have talked a lot about this, but a swagger. You know, they all have a confidence that 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 you know we're their own men. You know that sort of way, yeah. and, and you can see that in them. But we we I actually didn't get to see the game live, but to watch it back um, yesterday evening. And you text me and said when 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 Kilpatrick got the red, that's what yeah. kind of set a light under Tyrone, and and it, and it kind of goes back to the point originally about playing to what you have to suit your players. So yes. rather than the philosophy of we're going to do X, Y, or Z, Tyrone live for counter attack. And I thought their best patch of football was when Kilpatrick got sent off. They had the underdog sort of thing going on. They were getting a bit gnarly. I think that suits them. I think playing the underdog suits them. And go back to when they won the All Ireland a couple of yeah. years ago when Kerry bit the shit out of them down in Killarney. Yeah, that's yeah, goals. Yeah. I mean, that was the making their all Ireland. They were playing nice, open, expansive football. They got ripped apart down there. Yeah. All of a sudden they said, Here boys, let's get back to let's get back to brass tacks, let's defend, let's hit hard in the counter attack, nail our freeze and be absolute dogs. And I think that for all the nice football Tyrone have, I think that's where that's where they get results, you know. So it'll be interesting to see what way what way that goes next weekend. It's going to, it's going to be a ripping game of football, yeah. like it really is. And look, Derry will try and squeeze the life out of it. But I if Tyrone sit in and if Tyrone are patient and, and go after the counter attack as we as we've seen, like with 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 Derry over periods of possession, they'll flood that full forward line the same as what they've done for the last couple of years. And if Tyrone can nudge a couple of a couple of turnovers around the middle third, you know, you could see a couple of goal opportunities. So it's um I, I think Tyrone need to stick to what they're what they're good at, to be honest with you, you know. I thought when they went down to fourteen men as well, I thought Niall Morgan's game management was absolutely unbelievable. You know, he he was just he like you talk about a quarterback, like he was, you know, controlling things, slowing things down, knowing when to go, when not to go. His kickouts, uh, there was a couple of beautiful angles actually from TG Carry yesterday where you could actually look at the movement out the field and a couple of kickouts he pinged. But Turlock was coming, uh, obviously missing the St Bridges contingent. I know you're a big St Bridges fan. You've seen them a number of times this year. Brian Stack, Con- uh, Connor Carl. Uh, sorry, Ben O'Carroll, um, Connor Carroll's the goalkeeper, uh, Brian Stack, Ben O'Carroll, Eddie Nolan. I'm just thinking of names at the top of my head, Kieran Sugar, players who would have been, you know, probably available for Davy yesterday. Davy's had a tough winter. He's lost uh, his trainer, uh, Mark McHugh. He's lost Kieran Murta. Uh, he's lost Kian McKeown, who's a really strong, powerful, you know, black spot runner, as I would call him. Uh, Enda Smith being injured, you know, a massive, he's their talisman, massive, massive loss to them. Like, this is a massive game for us coming next weekend, Tor, like at home to Galway. Massive game. Both teams who have lost their first two games. Yeah, yeah. Galway, she's Galway. I thought Galway were awful. I thought they were awful. I mean, they showed no fight at all, really, against Mayo. Uh, Joyce's record against Mayo is, is appalling. I think he's lost eight out of ten games against him since he took over, and uh, they just showed, just seemed to be clueless on the pitch. To be honest, which you did no idea how to break down Mayo, and did no idea how to contain Mayo. Um, so I think Gall are under pressure. I think Gall Gall could be a team that are going to be in trouble this year. Yeah. That's my opinion. It's, and and Ross Common, Ross Common too. You know that a very good year last year, but as you said, if they're 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 down those bodies now, and this this is this is the thing that yeah. was a surprise factor probably last year in Division yeah, One with, yeah. with Ross Common, Daniel. You know. Davy brought them in. They were wild defensive. You know they got a lot of numbers behind the body. The league football suited them. Every everyone was fit. Everyone was fit. And this is the point I made about even my own time with Common, like, and and chatting to Brian Carr, the chairman, about this. Like he was talking about, you know, they want a situation where they're bringing through four to five underage players every year, like a Kerry, like a Dublin. You know, they can they can compete at the highest level. But really and truly, when you lose an Enda Smith, a Kieran Murda, you know, a, a Kane McKeown, all of a sudden the replacements, you know, just maybe just aren't Daniel at that level, which which is Division One, the t- the top six or seven teams, you know. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and you know, it's it's funny, like not not many teams can afford to lose players the caliber of Enda Smith either. Like, I mean, I, you're even looking at Dublin at the weekend, looked a little bit yeah. callow without James McCarthy, without looks, without that spine yeah. of leadership spine. It, it it is a it is a common theme for as much as it's it's such a team game these days. Like, you still lose big players. It has it it, it knocks it out of you. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, from Ross Common's point of view, definitely. I thought they, they probably had an edge last year, conditioning-wise. I thought they kind of you, you get the the new manager spurt as well, which kind of you, you get a you get a bit of a bounce out of that. Um, they they weren't. I didn't think they were awful at the weekend. I, I like you know going to Tyrone is never easy. No. But as you said, missing that little bit of quality, you know. I mean, if the, if that goal stood in the last couple of minutes, she was still the same. She was still. Yeah, you know, like I mean, that that kind of looks like a different game all of a sudden. So, yeah. and and it's funny perception as we as we talked about in the league. When if you're a team that isn't very confident in your in your ability and what your outlook is, like if, if Davy Burke has been targeting this division one game one lads, all my first day out, you know, yeah, yeah. if you put a lot of eggs into the first game and it doesn't go to plan, 
you've, yeah. you've a week to build it back up again and now all of a sudden you have a local derby with Galway yeah that, you know, so and, and this is the beauty of the league because you don't have yeah. too much time to you don't have six and, weeks to make your wounds, you know. And Turlock, Tur- like, I don't know if you remember my first like I was telling a story at the weekend, I was down in Cork at the weekend at the coaching conference in Cork and I was chatting to a few people and I was telling the story, it was a funny story, like I was telling the story about uh two thousand seventeen when I got involved with Carlo yourself and uh, Daniel was obviously playing and we got a draw, Daniel, in the first game against Westmead. And, you know, Brendan Murphy gave the big speech after it. There was too many boys getting haircuts and stuff like that and getting carried away. I remember the week of the, the week of the... So we were home to London the following week and it was a midterm here in, 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 at home here for school. We were off. So I said to Marie and the girls, you know, we'll hammer London. We'll, we'll smash London at home. So come on down and we'll stay for the weekend. So I remember ringing Dempsey, will you, can we put the family up in the, in the uh, what do you call it, the Mount Woosley? And uh, lo and behold, London beat us at home, you know, and it was a dark place. Like that cheese room was toxic. But, but lads, I don't know if you remember this. The, this for me was a big turning point. Turning. We took a massive gamble in the following week game because we could have sat for two weeks turning and it, we could have rotted and it could have got, you know, stale. But we went to cross with Lane. Do you remember that? And we played Armagh. Now, it was an Armagh third string, like, but we played them and we beat them by a point and Sean Murphy played middle of the field for the first time. But th- that that was a real lifter and, you know, it gave the thing a big boost. But Daniel, if you're sitting there, Turlick, and as a manager and you've lost your first two, it's a big two weeks. That third, you know, that, that gap between the second and third game is a big two weeks, Turlick, isn't it? Like, Absolutely. You know? it's, it's, these games can pick and fast to you, you know, and players can be fickle too, you know. They can, they can be taken in by... You know, people talk in between games and yeah, it can drop very, very quickly, you know. Oh, what are you doing? And you're going nowhere. This this gets into your players' heads, you know. Uh sometimes it just it's it's very hard to control that. You know, it you, you really need nearly a you know, a really insulated dressing room, no other voices and lads fully tuned in and focused. But it is hard. It's hard when you lose two games, you know, you know that league is probably gone from you and you're just playing for a bit of respectability, really, you know, and another another loss when you're under serious, serious pressure, you know. So yeah. it's it's very difficult, but yeah, that, know, that London game was, was a big disappointment that right that year. It was, it was, it was. But yeah, I blame the horse anyway for having his breakfast too late, coming in late, and his man scored one three in the first five minutes, but we'll not we'll not go into that. But hey, hey let's you see the you see that game next week, Galway. And Roscommon, you could always sort of probably everybody was building up Tyrone, Tyrone and Roscommon this week, saying the loser this is going to be in trouble. But the loser next week of that game is definitely in trouble. Definitely in trouble. Yeah, I agree with you. And and yeah. just you know we kind of touched on Roscommon, but I think Galway, what worked for Galway previously when it got to that All Ireland final, they had a very clear identity. And yeah. I, what I liked was they set out their camp and said we're going to defend properly and we're going to have a real nasty element in our, in in the middle of our kind of defensive cordon, you know. And and mm. Jesus, I thought I, I thought Mayo just walked through, especially against the wind in the first yeah. half. They walked down the middle of the defense like they they look passive and they look they look really wow. soft and vulnerable, you know. And there's been, no, there's been no additions, lads, to that management team, right? So obviously John Dibley's a brilliant coach. I've seen John in action; he's top class. But Kieran on Kieran O'Neill seemed to be doing a lot of the the coaching on. Saturday or sorry Sunday seemed to be doing a lot of the changes. I don't know if you noticed that on TV, but he seemed to be at the forefront of the changes. He seemed to be yeah. the man giving the last instructions. And you're sort of thinking to yourself, too, Ledge, you know, every county sort of freshens their management team too, particularly the you know, the better county stuff. You've likes of Armada they're brought in Gilligan this year. You know, there, there's other counties down. Obviously, they brought in Kiermina. There's counties trying to obviously, you know, even Leitham, for example, Andy Moore and brought in Mickey Graham just for a wee bit added extra. Fresh voice, and sometimes maybe that's stealing too. And 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 talking off stealers to like. Shane Walsh has played a lot of football, a lot of football. I, I thought he looked tired on Sunday. I thought he looked tired on Sunday. Yeah, well, I do, he, was, he was on a losing team, really, you know. Um, I wouldn't read too much into his performance. <laughs> That's what you, uh, I think Gall are in trouble, though. They're missing so many players, like Peter Cook has yeah. been last this year, you know. Massive, massive. Uh, Comer's injured, Sean Kelly's injured. Kelly's huge, yeah. yeah, they're they're big, big losses, you know. Um, and Silk was missing. Um so I suppose if they got those players back, uh, they'd be in a stronger position. But to me, they don't look like a team knows what they want to do on the pitch. You know mm. what 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 kind of game plan they have, and uh, they're a little bit headless to me now. And they're a big disappointment. I, I I just think they're going the wrong direction. I think themselves and Russ Common could be the two teams that go down in the division. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Like, and I suppose we'll we'll leave the last shout in Division One to probably the performance of the weekend. Uh, written off yet again. 
uh, the perennial underdogs, Monaghan. And again, lads, to, to share a wee, a wee story, because I know coaches that are listening yeah. to this on, on Kieran's uh, group, like they like the, the coaching element to it. I, I, I probably remember another story, obviously, from our own experience, where we got a sports psychologist in Turlick to talk about, you know, obviously breaking that mold. We were ranked, and I don't know if you guys remember this, we had found a ranking that we were ranked 29th in Ireland. And, you know, we were sort of saying, do we want to accept this? Do we want to keep this? And I think I think we did get to about 18 or 19th. Uh, I think our goal was maybe to try and get to, to that halfway barrier. But but the, the, the analogy was used of Monaghan, you know, one of the smallest counties in Ireland. Before Malachy Rook arrived, they had zero history or tradition of any All-Ireland wins or any major trophies. And all of a sudden, Malachy broke that sort of stranglehold. They won an Ulster title. And, and now, like, you've got to be saying, Daniel, they're, they're top six. They're the top six team in Ireland. And to see Monaghan in an All-Ireland semi-final, man, it's not a big surprise anymore, you know, really and truly. I, I actually thought there was going to be a fair bit of a rebuild process for Vinnie Corey. You know, I thought, I thought it was going to take take time like I, I don't think anyone we've, we've talked about Monaghan people in general I don't think anyone would have questioned the their ability to eventually climb the mountain again but I just I I, I thought they were really refreshing to watch like I, I said to you after the game Steve like maybe yeah. I don't know how the attrition of an Ulster Championship game of you know in, in, in a narrow pitch up and over might suit them but I thought they had some the speed the yeah. the energy I thought they played with like there was an element and, and this maybe sometimes comes with inexperience that they played with an awful lot of bravery, sometimes naivety, but their ability to go at a weak shoulder, I thought, was something that, and obviously Vinny talked about it afterwards, where he said this is something they're coaching, to coach the one-on-one, to go after one-on-one when they see it. Like Stephen O'Hanlon, obviously, is, you know, <laughs> freakish pace, not many lads can do it, but I, I thought in general, like McNulty coming in, like, I mean, Jesus Christ, thought, like slotting in, slotting in one-one, looked like he'd been playing all his life. Um, I, I I just thought they had I thought they had a vibrancy and an energy about them that I thought was really refreshing and um as I said that maybe sometimes that comes with a bit of youth and and a bit of an experience but new kind of leaders were were popping up from as well like you know it, I thought um Gary Moan in the middle of the field I thought had a really big game you know he's probably yeah. their he's probably their target on kickouts he's probably their a bit of an enforcer and um, I thought he was really good and and. Uh, Neil Bannigan again was excellent, and and O'Hanlon obviously. But in, in general, in in general, I thought Monaghan were very very refreshing. I thought Croke Park suited them down to the ground. I, you know, when they when they had the opportunity to sniff out a goal, they went after it, went after it really hard. You know, um, obviously Dublin are a bit disappointing. I think I I think Dublin look a little bit callow when they're missing when they don't have their full whack. I think uh, I don't know. There's a bit of personality missing in some aspects. I think, um, like even even bringing back bringing on James McCarthy with 10 or 15 minutes to go. There's a little element of, I don't know, I'd be leaving that lad off for a while and let him have let, let him have a couple of a couple of months in the sun and kind of have him ready for championship. But anyway, look, be that as may, I, I was impressed at Mon and I have to say, we'll see how they get on as the league is, gets more traditional. It could become harder for them, but I, I thought they were really refreshing to really refreshing to watch. Turlick, it's interesting, Daniel says that. It'd be interesting to see now, Turlick, if next week the softer pitch at Clonus will actually suit Monaghan because they have such, you know, uh, yes, yeah. and vibrance about them. Maybe Crow Park was absolutely made for them, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and maybe the softer fields and heavier fields of Clonus and the likes of this, you know, w- won't suit them. What, what's your thoughts? Uh, look, I just, no, I, I think, uh, you think if you look at Monaghan over the last 10, 15 years, I mean, they've consistently been performing what we would call above their station, really, like, you know, they're, They've been an outstanding, really, for a county of its size uh, to consistently do that. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is really good leadership uh, yeah. t- in team yeah. management yeah. And, on the, and in the county board as well. Yeah. yeah. And there seem to be one of the most progressive county boards around, you know, um, the way they're yeah. organizing competitions. And, uh, you know, Vinny coming in there, I think, has been a real, a really, really good uh, decision, you know, by, by Monaghan County Board to keep him involved there. And I think there's a great, there's a great sense of, Unity and purpose about them, you know. It's a small yeah. county, punching yeah. above its weight, and Ulster so competitive, you know. And everybody in Ulster wants to, wants to beat their neighbours, and you know, they're, it's just in them, like you know. And there's yeah. obviously super footballers as well, you know. So, um, but I remember chatting Turlick to Martin Corey, uh, Jesus Turlick, eight nine years ago. I remember chatting to him, and like you're talking about nearly ten years ago, and Martin was doing a recovery pack, you know those sort of things, the Daniel foam rollers and balls and things like that. And Martin's Vinny's brother, and he's doing a lot of coaching in, in Monaghan. He's a very good coach, you know, really, really smart guy. But I remember him telling me at the time, like if you went for an under fourteen development squad job in Monaghan, right? The you'd want to be you'd you'd be going for an interview. There'd be there'd be other candidates. 
you'd have to present a presentation to the county board. You know, this is an under 14 development squad job. And I think of our own county here and the absolute cockaloo that goes on and the nonsense that goes on with development squads and things like that and how far behind from a structured point of view we are. And it's a county that have their house in order. Like, and, and everybody's got oh, Monaghan, Monaghan. But they have a system in order. They have a coach education system. They have a development squad system. The likes of Patricia and Karen McCross are doing fierce work. St. McCartan's, their schools are strong. You know, they're competitive. And, and this is the thing. If you have your house in order from the bottom, up it's only natural then you're going to drip feed a player or two in every year and that culture is going to be existed that you know there are minors for example last year daniel managed by desi mo or desi uh Desi Malone, uh, we 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 Malone, who obviously was a Dermy, sorry, Dermy Malone, Very who was well, obviously yeah. a really, really competitive, hardy footballer. Like, but you know, now he's given his bit back, he's given his experience in there too as well. And you know, their structures are good, their 21s are competitive, they were beaten in Ulster final there two years ago, too. And and I just think Turlick, teams, counties can learn an awful lot from Monaghan, like and the model of Monaghan as well. Absolutely, you know, I mean. Oh, Scotsman obviously a great year this year, like, but the club football in, in Monaghan has been very, very good for a long time now. And, you know, as well, you know, the organiser competitions, the league competitions there, uh, they, they brought in some kind of a very innovative point system when county players weren't playing. And, uh, yeah. you know, rather than demean their, their, their competitions, they actually enhanced them and yeah. get the most out of them, you know, and yeah. that's giving you a stronger playing pool to pick from. Yeah, the 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 the, the, the league, the, the strong league, is critical for creating a culture of you know yeah. you're, you're creating county players in your clubs. So yeah. if you have a, if you have it, I know we've, we've probably talked about this before, the three of us. But if you have a 10, 15 league, a uh, game league, your players have to be conditioned. They have to be ready just to survive that. You know, so you're you're getting SNC probably is been properly exposed, lads being exposed to the club scene. So then if some lad has two or three good years in club, twenty two years of age. He goes into a county setup already having done six, seven years of SNC. So you're, 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 you're. I know the SNC is not everything, but it's a massive part in modern game for calling a spade a spade. Like if you, yeah. if you're fairly strong, fast, you can r- remain injury free, and you have half a head in your shoulders. You're going off a long way in the game, you know. And, and people might like the reality of that, but that's what it is. And if you have a good club scene, that's that's breeding players for your county scene, you know. And and the leagues and the structures are a huge part of that, and and probably. Uh, an untouched an unt- untouched side of this is you know every resource they have has been exploited and maximised yeah. and probably not having yeah. hurling as well is a massive. Well, I know they have a small pocket, yeah. but let's yeah, no, it play the spade. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's it's a huge but at the very top. Though they've been they've had really really good leaders. You know, I mean, guys that have been at the top in Croke Park. You know, as as president of GA and as uh, our as our steward of ours in their county and 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 you know. St- still active there like it's it's yeah. it's phenomenal like it's phenomenal it's it's really United County that's what I see in them anyway that they're really all going the same direction all pulling together and yeah. when you have that in the county new unity in the county it's, it makes it so much easier like a lot of counties fall asunder because there's you know inter-club rivalries and uh, there's politicking going on and uh, they pull themselves apart really you know I think it seems to be the opposite of and and and, and just Steve, sorry, just the the the, the Vinnie Corey element, like uh, being a player still and only recently retired from county football. Like there, there are little, I think, little ad- advances you can make when you're that close to it that you're seeing, you're seeing little tweaks, you're seeing how teams, even how teams are defending. And I'm convinced this the idea of going after one on ones is not by is not by chance. Like you see, so many teams will will shepherd and will channel rather than actually go on contact in a one on one scenario. And you, the, the the ability to find a weak shoulder. The other day it was happening so regularly from on and i don't think it was coincidence like you know so it's interesting just when you when you get a manager a young manager that's that's that active in the game just just to to, to get these little nuances maybe that are slightly ahead of slightly ahead of the pack because like we all know ourselves even when you step back for a couple of years now there are certain things you'll be getting feedback from players and you're like jesus oh. didn't, didn't know that now you know yeah honestly God, so it's yeah. it's funny when he when he's when he's still so close to it you know yeah and i like this interview afterwards you know that you had that kind of uh, in him, you know, uh, talk about Rory Bacon and that, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, he's probably still in a position where he can treat Rory, you know, and turn around and say, I'm here, would you catch yourself on going to the NFL for fuck's sake? You know what I mean? And what are you going to do out there? You know, and, 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 uh, you we know, and that, that's the thing, whereas a lot of managers might not get away with that. But, but funny interest, I've seen a thing on, on Twitter tonight that they're actually running a coach education evening on Wednesday night with Jack Cooney, the former Westmead manager, over in their centre of excellence in, in Clon. And that's again, lads. 
a massive advantage for any county, you know, to have a center of excellence, Daniel, where the culture, you know, the development squads are all there, to like on a Saturday, they're all singing the same hymn sheet. There's a nice togetherness, and you know, it's it's a massive thing for any county, massive. Like, but lads, moving on, to Division Two, uh, it's it's 2012 all over again. Jimmy's winning matches, uh, so is uh, this this time this time it looked as if in the first half, albeit. Wind assisted. Uh, there was very much a manic, manic full court press from Donegal in that first half against Cork, and Cork did get in the behind. They got in. They got in for a goal. They got in a couple of a couple of other occasions where they could have got goals. But uh, Donegal just a wee renewed freshness about them this year. Ryan McHugh coming back in is a massive plus. But it sort of makes you chuckle a wee bit as well too because it's the same players and it just sort of. I don't know. I don't know. I just have questions about it. it nearly just re- reminds me of poor John Joe Doherty all those years ago when they were walking it across McLean laughing. And then and the, the next year, the same boys are, are kicking the ball away from an all right final. It goes to show you, Turlick, as you say, how fickle players are. But but Jim has certainly given the whole thing a lift on you. Yeah, I. It, it's really interesting. Like Everyone's kind of waiting for what is the big new secret he's going to have to revolutionise the game. And and look, yes, back in 2011, there probably there was a certain uh, a certain amount of revolution or evolution, whatever way you want to call it. But I think ultimately McGuinness's big thing is is buy in, and yeah. I think he you you spoke about energy. Like I mean, as you, Donegal did nothing that they haven't been doing for the last five, six, seven years. The other day, they just did it with a real vigor and a real energy. And you know, it, it's it's as you say, players are players are funny. Like on 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 and what they'll buy into and. Obviously, Jim has this personality that attracts people. You know, very few people have the kind of magnetism that he has, I, I don't think, you know. And, like, again, he gets he gets tarnished with the defensive brush an awful lot. And, like, I think he looks at a scenario, just, again, just, just my uh, outside view opinion, but he looks at a scenario and says, right, these are the players I have. This is what will work for this certain group of players. Like, and, and you could see that even with, with, with you know, with the Donegal game, it wasn't retreat straight back to the forty-five. He's looked at the game. He's looked at the game, how the game has changed, and he has, but he's, he'll put his own stamp on it. But it definitely won't be. There's not going to be any secret. There could be coaches there, video, and see see what happens next, or the, the wall around the training grounds. There's going to be nothing outrageous. Like we've all heard of the infamous hand passing drills from the twenty-one to the end line, where you're doing for forty-five minutes at, at fairly high pace. Like there, 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 there probably are no real major secrets. But what it is is the aura of the possibility of there being something. You know, the the thought of what's McGinnis going to do now and. Teams will second guess that, you know. So, like, I've no doubt there will be nuances, and probably more so when we come to championship, we might see a few little bits and pieces. But as regards a massive shift in dynamic, I don't think so. I think it's just buying. Turlick, Turlick, management, management. Like, like you think of of Man United, and I want to use this as an example. Like, you think of some of the players that Alex Ferguson had. You know, your Danny Welbeck, your Tom Cleverties, you know, your your G Sung Parks, these guys. But he made them feel as if they were like just world beaters you know and I think that's a real real good sign of a, of a good man manager as Daniel talks about you know, squeezing the best out of a player getting the most out of them and and I would say a large part of, of Jim's aura is just actually his personality I don't know who those players are that you're talking about there I never heard of them before <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I don't know what you're about there but uh, yeah look I, I Jimmy Guinness will bring organisation you know he'll bring a, a, he'll have a very defined game plan uh, players will know exactly what to have to do and players take a lot of comfort from that you know that the manager knows what he's about he knows what we, he wants us to do we know what he wants us to do and we train to do that and yeah. I thought it was great to see actually Donegal the shooting from long range again uh, yesterday was like they were a few years ago I haven't seen that I didn't see it last year that their shooting was let them down actually I thought their, I thought their long range shooting yesterday was fantastic yeah. Uh but a couple of things about the game, though. Like, it's a huge journey from Cork to Donegal. You you go up there and you're facing into a gale force wind in the first half yeah. against a team that puts on such a high press on you. They were they're really their backs were against the wall. Now I actually saw some good flickers of encouragement in the Cork performance, uh, and people aren't really giving many credit. I thought they moved the ball quite well at times. They got they opened them up quite a few, a few times. Um, so you know I know it, they were well beaten in the end on the scoreboard maybe but uh, from both, uh, both sides I think both teams can take something out of it but I think Donegal obviously you know I think McGuinness' back is definitely a, it's worth five or six points at Donegal at least you know and yeah. they'll be structured they'll be organised they'll have buy-in 100% buy-in uh, something that you all have talked about they'll have uh, role clarity and clarity roles and they'll all do exactly what they're supposed to do you know um, it'll be a happy camp uh, a camp that worked very very hard 
And hard work, really, lads, is, you know, it's 90% of the job, really, isn't it? You know, I mean, the teams that work hardest usually win. It's as simple as that. Yeah. I would say that there'll be a lot of demand for tickets for them and Derry in the championship, the opening round of the championship anyway in Ulster. I'd say there'll be a big demand for those tickets. That's going to be a spicy one. But yeah, I think Donegal will come out too. But lads, moving on to one of your one of your favourite teams, uh, Jimmy Highland, Darren Kerwin, Paddy Woodgate, Ben McCormick, Paddy McDermott, Kevin Feely, Kevin Flynn, Michael Cranny. Like, it's this killer team, like 12 points at home to Cavan. Like, like they, they remain a mystery to me. They remain a mystery. And I know I've got stick in the past for giving them stick, but... Like, I, I watched Cavan in the McKenna Cup against Down. I thought Ocean Brady was outstanding. I thought Cavan actually, to be fair, played really, really well that night. Down were very, very fortunate that night. They got two late goals uh, to, to drag themselves back into the game. And I know it was only the McKenna Cup, but I was impressed. I was impressed with Cavan. Uh, again, Daniel, what you talked about, it's 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 Remy's first venture into management. Uh, you know, having done goals for so long, Remy Gallagher, and, you know, probably having his ear close to the ground and being close to the players obviously has helped. Like, this. Cavan has some good players. Like, you know, Paddy Lynch, a good footballer. Dar McVitie's a class footballer uh, they do have some great great players in bit of Kelly, but lads surely to God like what, what is going on in Kildare like what is going on like I, I don't know I, sure, I, it's, I, it's nothing it's nothing new it's Groundhog Day Kildare you think they're making a little bit of progress in the summer and they come back to the league and they look like they're back to square one and they'll slowly slowly tip away and they, they might get a few wins in the summer and then they'll go back to square one again like you know it's it's ultimately it's it's very Kildare like and I think that's the, that's just the reality and obviously playing at home is then the real home these days now in Carlo, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, with, that's uh, true. But they brought in, they brought in, they brought in Colum Nally. Colum's a, a really good coach. Colum's been around a long time. He's an experienced coach. Uh, you know, and he, he's obviously worked with, with top teams like Meath and, and Louth and the likes of that. But, but do they need nearly a Paddy Tally type influence? Do they need someone to come in and try and install a bit of sort of, I don't know what the right word, politically correct word to use here is like, but a wee bit of grit, a wee bit of a wee bit of stubbornness, you know, and and just just what Tally brought to that carry, you know, that stubbornness defensively is. But but then you look at the attacking talent, and you think how can the, how can they not score more than twelve points? I just cannot understand Claire, quite honest with you. Um, they played Carlo in the Bourne Cup, and they came down with a full strength team. Carlo played an under strength team really, and. I think it was the all Ireland final they were playing in, the way they played football at night. I don't know whether they're making a statement because of what was beaten in 2017, I don't know. But I, I just was mystified because I know they had played a niche in a practice game the week before. Uh, they went over with a development squad and just McNulty was furious. Leash kicked them off the park. Then right. they put after play Carroll with their full strength team. Like, what was the purpose of it like? Yeah, you know, the Bourne Cup. Yeah. Surely, do, I mean, for instance, the, the Nace guys were only given a week off after after Leinster Leinster final, and the no the no alternative but they had to get back in. You know, and they all played against Carlo. I didn't see any any, any real merit in it for, for their own their own sake. You know, um, I remember going back then to when we did beat them in two thousand seventeen. I remember going back over to the hotel afterwards, and there was a Kildare player, a very prominent Kildare player in in the hotel that we were in, and you would think he was on holidays. Uh, quite honest with you, I would have been hiding. Uh, if I was a Kildare player, I'd have been hiding away somewhere rather than. Was that the uh, same man that Daniel and Ledger Egos that day? No, was that? Or I mean, no, sorry. He didn't how often? How often? You're going to get some mileage out of this. It's very confusing. <laughs> You will not answer for. Yeah, but look, there is there is something wrong. You know, I, I don't know. I don't think they moved on under Glen Ryan at all. Um, yeah. I don't think that's worked. Um, I think they're stuck in a rut. Yeah, they have they have serious talent. They have serious talent, and 100%. yeah, just... Tarlow, do you think right now this may be going down a philosophical route a little bit more? But from a, a say um, a geographical point of view, with Kildare, that you have so many Kildare people will be. Dublin people, you'll have people who will be commuting into the town, maybe the next generation to come by. Is there a lack of togetherness for Kildare football? I don't know, like you're looking at towns like Selbridge, Kilcock, up that part of the world, and then you come down to a tie. Is there a disconnect somewhere? Because you said, why are the lads from Johnstown Bridge or wherever else not too worried about Kildare? I, I don't know, there's something, something is off. Then, I don't know what how, it is. Come, how come Dublin succeeded? You know, they have people from all over the country as well. You know, so best GA people in Dublin are really country people at heart and mm-hmm. it's in the gel fairly well up there you know so I don't think that's the reason um but there there certainly is a there's a there's there's a perception about I think Kildare football that they're you know they're they're showmen and 
Mm. They don't really, they don't really, you know, when the tough questions are asked, they don't really have the answers. And, mm. um, so, you know, they did it once, maybe again, Mayo, it was me, it was Newbridge and nowhere. And, uh, it, that was about the last time really I seen anything from them, but, um, they're definitely the, the most uh, underperforming county in the country, I would say, for the talent that's available to them. Which is sad because uh, yeah. you need challenging for someone needs to challenge Dublin and Leinster, you know, and they, they are the county for the players to do it. Well, I suppose the two for me, lads, or the other team I'm going to mention here now, very similar is me. You know, two teams that you would expect that can actually sort of maybe say to Dublin, right, you know what? We're going to bring you out of your comfort zone this year. We're going to give you a rattling Leinster. We're going to give this a good go. And and they just seem to be as far away as ever. And and they, that result at the weekend, they won the Talchip Cup last year. And I thought, you know what? You talked about this, Ledge. You used this terminology where you sort of swallow the ego. And I think Colin O'Rourke was probably put under a bit of pressure uh, going into the Talchip Cup final. We can't play against Down the way we want to play because Down have unbelievable pace. Down scored eight goals in a Talchip Cup semi final. So the alarm bells were already there. You know, this is a goal hungry team. And I couldn't believe that he actually swallowed his ego in the Talchin Cup final and went with a really deep line zone defensive system against Down, suffocated the space. And as everyone in the country knows, if you deny Down space, like, you know, that team's going to struggle because they do rely on, on, on you know, on hard runners. But like, you're looking at Matthew Costello, Aaron Lynch, like real good forwards, good footballers, like, but just 12 all at home to Fermanagh. A Fermanagh team, lads, who lost Ryan Jones or Tally's man, Darren McGurman's injured, you know, a couple of, a couple of high profile retirees. And Fermanagh, who, you know, historically have probably been harder to beat at home than they are away. And let's be honest, like Fermanagh are a very, very durable side, a, a, a dogged side, but they're not, if you have aspirations, boys, of getting to Division 1, like you need to be beating Fermanagh at home, you know? Yeah, um, that's another uh, another commuter county, you another full of, full of expat yeah. jobs. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I think, um, I think, yeah, I, 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 again, we didn't, didn't see many highlights of the game or anything like that, but you'd imagine Fermanagh came down with a plan with a very clear, yeah. defined low block, as you said. And, and mm. you know, if Mead were, the only way to beat that kind of a block sometimes is patience and being very deliberate and almost mirroring it. I don't know how well that would go down in Park Talton. You know, I'm not sure it would uh, it would be in keeping with what the, the Mead public would be looking for. And and sometimes sometimes very hard to do that in a league game in January. It's much easier to do it in the final in Croke Park when it's it's do or die, you know. So, um. Yeah, look, Mead are dominant underage pretty much coming right through the ranks. Like, you know, but yep. it, it's 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 not feeding through as it's a very similar situation to Kildare, to be honest with you. There there's mm. um there's massive similarities. But I yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the Talton Cup last year was, was a bit of flattery. Maybe they have Sam in their minds already. They have they're already qualified from Sam McGuire. Maybe they're maybe the league isn't priority this year. Maybe it's a full tilt. I know Conor Rourke said they hadn't done a whole lot pre Christmas. <laughs> Um, I I don't know. I'm not sure, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be inspiring confidence. Like you know, it, it is as you said, Fermanagh are a very durable side, absolutely. But geez, they're no no world beaters even in comparison yeah. to Cavan. They wouldn't they wouldn't. Yeah. Be there and again, Turlick, again, Turlick, this is a massive game for me this weekend. They go to the athletic grounds on Saturday night, like and Arma will be like that place will be rocking on Saturday night for me. Like, yeah, it's probably the best. Thing. Probably the best venue uh, in the country, uh, Arma, I would say. It's uh, great. It creates a good atmosphere. Tight ground, lovely yeah, tight yeah. ground, you know. And yeah. you know, I th- we need more games in, in venues like that. To be honest with you, I think yeah. Arma are not exactly, you know, setting the world alight either. Like you know, they're no. just they're flattering to the sea. Really, they're not not yeah. pushing on. And well, the unavailability, the unavailability of of Rion and Neil obviously is a major, yeah, a major uh, a factor for them. And then obviously as well, Cully Hanna won the intermediate title, and you know, Kieran McKeever obviously the coach would have been involved in that team as well. That's his home club, so you know, uh, maybe they just haven't had the full deck. There's maybe been a bit of distraction in the lead up to the league, and you know, I think I think Saturday night was a massive win for them. Turlick against Loud. Now I watched the game. I uh, thought Loud were wild and impressive. They were w- really well organised. Uh, you know, that a, a couple of outstanding individual performances. Uh, you know, Craig Lennon was outstanding, uh, man of the match. Uh, you know, I thought defensively they were very, very solid. Sam Roy on another night, if, you know, his freeze had been had been on, on sync, you know, they probably would have come out of the athletic grounds with two points. But it's mad because, lads, here's an interesting one for you. And this is a coaching perspective, Daniel. So I still harbour regrets over that incident we talked about with Down in the last minute in 2019. And you're a man up and it's an equalising score and there's seven minutes on the clock and you're thinking seven minutes over time, you're thinking press the kick out or drop. And we decided to drop and Down got one more chance. Armagh did this in the Ulster final last year, lads. They went a point up against Derry. 
they dropped off the kick out and Derry went down the field and equalised. The other night, they went 12-10 up, playing with the breeze and decided to drop off the kick out. Lowe's got the short kick out away, but then 20 seconds had scored to make it 12-11. Then turned Armagh over and worked then the opportunity, Daniel, which should have ultimately been the equalising score. You go back to Glen in the All-Ireland Club final, or sorry, semi-final against Kilmacud, went a point up deep in injury time and Connor Glass is squealing press. And Glass takes the initiative. They press Kilmacud's kick out. And what happens? They turn it over. And Ethan Doherty walks the ball into an empty net. And I just think that late in the game, there's two things, lads, from a coaster perspective. And I want your views on this. Early in the game, there's going to be much more movement for a kick out. So, therefore, pressing early, is it worth pressing a kick out early when there's going to be that much movement? Players are fresher, more alert. Late in the game, lads, there's going to be less movement. There's going to be a bit of anxiousness as well with the goalkeeper and the outfield players who wants possession to have ball so late. And pressure creates panic so late. So, you know, is, is pressing the kick out later in a game of, of more advantageous for a team, Daniel, than, than, than early? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I Yeah, I, I would probably say so. I, I think like there's enough evidence to su- suggest our match should probably in that scenario in future kind of give up on that. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's, there's, there's, there's been enough history there to show that maybe they're better on the front foot. And again, maybe that, as you say, later in the game, pressing the kickout is nearly a safer option than dropping off because it's, yeah. dropping off would be seen as the, as the, the kind of safe option that they, the, the, the you, you won't concede if you drop off, but that might've been six, seven years ago. It's a different story. Yeah. Now we've talked about this before with, with teams are so good. Structure yeah. Like, listen, yeah. We, we're all coaching. How many times like, Jesus, you could do it for 15 minutes a night where you practice teams dropping off and giving you the ball in the middle third and your practice breaking that down. Teams are doing that religiously. Whereas six, seven, eight years ago, you probably weren't as much, you know? So it's, I, I absolutely think, Again, it might depend on what you have. Maybe Armad don't trust what they have around the middle third. I don't see that. They have some fine athletes. Like I don't see why they need to be concerned about that. The, the movement thing is interesting. I I'm just I was putting my defender's hat on there. What do I want in the last minute of the game? Do I want to have to make a 60 yard run to the wing? I definitely don't. <laughs> or do you want to pick up a handy kick out? No, <laughs> Leave that to the quick lads. But. I, I want to get a handy kick out. Bottom line, I want to get a starter play. And as we've said before, the referee is inclined, you said it's for Turlo, the referee yeah. is inclined to play it out. It's Correct. inclined to play it out. And yep. it encourages, yeah. it encourages one yeah. more points, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Turlo, 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 I want your opinions. We, we talked about this today in the PE staff room, actually, we talked about it where we talked about Derry and Kerry on Saturday night. Derry went the point up and the, it was a brilliant run. Uh, what do you call the newcomer? Uh, it's his name's going to be McCluskey, is it? Oh, was it McCluskey? No, what do you call the newcomer? He came in 24. Oh, he uh, came brilliant. on, yes. Uh, uh, brilliant, brilliant run. And Sh- Shane McGuigan, but Shane McGuigan put the kick out over, or put the free kick over, and Kerry got the kick out away. And McQuillan, Joe McQuillan, played on. But he played, he was giving Kerry a chance, but Kerry fucked about that much that he actually just said, you know what, I'm going to blow it now. But yeah. he'll always give, the referee will always give them a chance. Will. Will. But know? there's two things happen. I think if you give up that kick out, you know, the referee is going to give them a chance, yeah. but also the team possession of the ball are going to play for free. They're going to look for yeah. contact. Yeah, any kind of contact, it's an easy option for the free for the referee. Yeah. Free in uh, level game. Ash, but but Turlick, Turlick, historically, if the ball's put down by the goalkeeper and there's like times up, and he takes clips a short kick out and they start attacking, right? Referees and kind of the go. But Daniel, if everybody pushes up. And the kickouts in mid-air, the referee's more likely to blow his whistle because yeah. it's a long kick out in mid-air. It's just a psychological thing, I think, from a referee's perspective, you know. So it definitely is an interesting one. It's an interesting yeah. one. I know what I'd be doing from a coaching perspective moving forward. If it was that late in the game and you're a point up, I, I think you'd be brave and just saying, fuck it, we'll press it, you know. I, I think this is where you have to evolve as a coach because I'd probably, as we've discussed a few years ago, I'd probably be saying yeah. you're dropping off most things. But yeah. the game has changed. Teams have got teams yeah. have gotten better at it, and and you have to you have to go with the times. For some, I, I think our are probably too rigid with that. Like I mean, there there is enough evidence for them to say squeezing kickouts they're better on the front foot, you know. And mm-hmm. as you mentioned with Glenn, they did in the semi final and the final as well. When when they really got squeezed and bridges, they felt it and they went after it, you know. And again, that's it's sensing the energy in the game and having the autonomy to do it. I mean, I remember Donahue here it was last year and he calling players back after they went one up and they yeah. were trying to play it down the field, yeah. like or went went level. 
maybe that needs to be on field. Maybe someone well, on the field should yeah, be Yeah, they, they've done it two years ago again on Galway as well, Daniel. And Fair done chance. it last year again, Derry, you know. So that's three years in a row sort of thing, like, and it's something that you nearly look at. But look, lads, Division 2, like, everyone's sort of going, oh, my Donegal, oh, my Donegal. But it just may not, it may not be that straightforward, depending on how the results go this weekend. But look, moving on to Division 3 there quickly. Um... Just uh uh the Isle County up there, uh down or up there, uh five points, a five point win against Wicklow Turlock wasn't unsurprising. Um, I think Wicklow and Limerick, I think, are heading back to the basement. Unfortunately, I think that's that's the way it'll be for me. I think uh I think Sligo are, have a wee bit more about them. Um, awfully, you know, Westmead an impressive win. I was looking at Westmead's record last year, lads. Here's one for you, okay? That a plus fifty score four plus fifty four score difference. In Division Three last year, and didn't get promoted like plus fifty four. That's highly unusual, boys. Highly unusual. And in your opinion, there, do you, do you see any surprises, or do you think it's going to be down in Westmeath? I, I, I just looking at Clare there. I think Clare would do very well to stay in Division Three this year. Change of manager, significant losses. Huge losses of players. Yeah, yeah. huge losses of players. Like players a generation, yeah. kind of has been cleared out there. Like that's a huge win for them against Ligo. A massive, a massive win. It might be the biggest. Massive. You know, it's not as glamorous as Dublin Monaghan, but that is a massive win for Clare to get them up and running. And yeah. I think if they stay up, it's almost as good as a promotion for them. I, I know probably yeah. Division Three isn't isn't the strongest at the moment, but you've got a lot of teams that are at a very very similar level. I I would say yeah. Westmead and Down are probably a step ahead of the rest, but yeah. there's going to be some battle for who's going down there. Yeah, so, like I'm looking at those bottom four, tour, like like Sligo, awfully. Wicklow and Limerick, like counties, you would have been sort of probably with with all respect, like they would have been associated with Division Four for a long time, yeah. you know. Uh, Division yeah, well, Four look, counties. I th- I think Limerick are in decline, uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. think they struggle. Um, yeah. Wicklow definitely yeah. maybe probably favourites go down. Yeah. Often they should stay up. Sligo should stay up. Uh, Clare have lost a lot of players, but I think they'll beat Wicklow. I think they'll beat like Limerick, uh, and that that will keep them up, you know. Um. Yeah, big win for uh, Antrim. And Antrim, Antrim might be in in with a shout for promotion. I I think they're too erratic, sir. Like I I yeah. I still think Antrim have that sort of Antrim lost to Longford last year. You know they beat Cavan and then lost to Longford. You know like like it's they have that erratic result in them. You know and and again they conceded more scores in Division Three last year than any team in the in the country. I think it was I think that a I think that a minus thirty eight score difference or something like that. It just stayed up with the skin of the skin of their teeth. But I think down left too much for the division. Uh they have a lot of pace. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mina has has evolved their their game a little bit as well. Daniel, interested you talk about pressing like down are not a big team, but they're mm-hmm. pressing teams like mad. And I, I'm I'm thinking, you know, they could get caught. They were caught three or four times against Cabin over the top, and there was three or four runners and only a last ditch tackle or a misplaced pass. And you know, well, three the, or four the, balls. The, the, the thing with that, Steve, like I I think again without going into too much detail, but if you have that, if you've committed to that for the year and you're going after presses, that's just that's your mo for the year. Like mm. you, you can you can be very clever about how you defend that as well. So if you line a four or five at the back of your press and kick out goes right, and you know what you can read a keeper, you can tell very quickly whether they're yeah. going left or whether they're going right. Your yeah. right wing backs on the far side of the field is should nearly be tucking back in as a sweeper straight away, almost heading yeah. for a B line for, right. for the B. And if you do lose a ball, at least you have a safety net there. And and, and again, it's risk reward. And yeah, I, it, but you have to practice. You can't just say we're going to press teams. I would imagine Down will be doing this every single night of training, over and over and yeah. over again. And yeah. I, I think the key thing to the press is not looking at it as surviving a kickout. It's looking at it as a scoring opportunity. And when you get that yeah. mindset into your players where it's an aggressive press, where they're aggressively trying to win the ball back rather than just stopping the opposition from catching it, I think that changed the mentality. And if you if you just have it in, in your head, you're going for break ball and you just get get something to get something to a kick out and, and your scavengers on the ground, like I, I, I think it's I think it's the way forward personally, you know, and if you practice it enough, that r- risk element can be negated to a certain point with, with good coaching, I think. And I think Mina Turlick, Mina obviously likes a, a sweeper keeper. Uh, he's made that very clear. And hence why probably Bobo Keane from Gilku has left the panel. Uh, Bobo's probably a traditionalist, like Daniel talked about Cluxon earlier. You know, that doesn't like to come out. You know, we, and, and, and Bobo, to be fair, in down, for me, Bobo Keane in down is probably the best executor of the short kick out under pressure. You know, uh, you know, Bobo's very, very good under pressure. Few de- devious doubts about him under high ball, etc. But obviously, Mina has favoured a keeper that wants to come out the field, and it it does bring its rewards to like, but it also brings high risk as well, and maybe maybe a wee bit of panic to it. Does it does you know it, like, the press press can you know continually for for seventy minutes is a big ask, 
you know, and we talked about it earlier, you know, but, but pressing at the end of the game, should you press or drop off? Depends on who you've on the pitch at the time, but depends on, you know, you know, maybe how, how players are, are the you know, lads tramping up, have your lads taken out with injuries? All these things come into play and you, you have to make, a, a, I think, a decision game by game what you're going to do um, and maybe you know, minute by minute even in a game. So you need great control on that from within the team. You need leaders in the team who can read a game and Derry in particular seemed to have a really, really good leader on the, on, on the pitch. They were able to read the game and, and, and direct what's happening on the pitch. Uh, not everything yeah. has that. Not everything no. has that, you know, mm-hmm. and they, they've got to work as a unit. Like if one of them, if one of them fails to do what they're supposed to do, uh, that high press can be broken. Yeah, and be big trouble. Yeah, interesting. Last division four, your old county boys off to a flyer. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a good story. I was coming home on Saturday from from Cork and I actually stopped at a, at a plaza just outside Port Leash. Uh, I didn't realize actually that I, I was doing something so dangerous stopping in Leash on my own, but uh, but I, I met the Leash manager in, in the in the in the plaza. He was having a coffee. Sugru, and I, th- I was just going to say, thank God it wasn't John Sugru or. or <laughs> I wouldn't have got away with that that delayed handshake, but it was it was Justin McNulty actually, and I was just asking him who have you got tonight, and he was saying Longford. And I said that's right, then we're chatting, and he just sort of said, look, we're going into the unknown a little bit. They won the O'Byrne Cup, but you know, you know yourself, time of the year, we don't know, and it was a big win for Leash boys. It was a big win, but he was telling me he's got Ross Munley in coaching, so obviously a man who who obviously has a lot of experience, a very smart footballer, and I'm sure he'll have added add a bit of value, you know, to, to Leash in some way. But but Turlick, Leash are probably a county that you would know very well. Obviously, you know the you know the players very well. You know the clubs like they have lost a lot of players too lads massive amount of players yeah, they're, they're, re- they're rebuilding as well you know um, yeah. there's no one really you know st- <laughs> there's no standard favourite no standout in this, in no. this at the moment no. I like to see you know uh, a team that might go very well are, are Wexford I think Wexford have, have every player in that they want in uh, right, okay. first in a long time and it'll be interesting to see how they, how they get on you know uh, yeah I, they play well. They play Leash this weekend, so 100 percent records going there anyway. You know, uh, one of those yeah, two teams. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I had a great win over Tipperary mm-hmm. uh, down in Turles. You were at it. Yeah, yeah. Played really, really well. Really Good well man. organized. Uh, thought that they, they, they were well worth their victory. Um, Tipperary to me, big turnover players there as well. A young team and weren't as organized as Carlo. Um, I think I think Carlo showed a lot of promise there. Uh, great pace in the team. Uh, yeah, there was pace. Yeah, 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 and and pace pace is a huge advantage, but only as you say, pace is a huge advantage only if it's utilized, Daniel, in the right way. Like Carlo went down to fourteen men, Turlock in that game when the game was in the balance, so they had to sit in, and when they sat in, their last four or five goal. scores were counter attacking scores. You know, yeah. so it sort of makes you think. Like, forget about trying to appease the 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 the, the paying public, and you know, oh, we're playing great football. Play, sit in and use your strengths to your advantage. You know, and and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and and play on the counter attack. Like I that's thought, what, I think that's. That's where the player best for the last two or three years has been counterattacking football. Uh, yeah. They've massive pace in the team, and uh, they're 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 attacking you know in, in droves numbers together. And I think they could they could be well in the mix here uh, at the end of the league. You know, that'd uh, be good to see. That'd be good to see. Good for the likes of Dara there, Daniel, who's hanging on. Foley there's hanging on, isn't he? I think he's oh, the, yeah. him and Jordan are probably the only two players that were there when you were there, are they? Yeah, there's a bit. There's a fairly significant turnover, and, and look, it, it's it's we're we're saying this, we're kind of repeating ourselves here, and it, and it just goes to show you, especially as you come down to divisions, that the, the turnover of players across the board yeah. in division yeah. three and four is phenomenal. Yeah. It really yeah. is, and and you can see it. Like I, we have a fellow in school that was on the Longford panel this year, a teacher with us, and he's saying kind of two selectors and a coach left Longford before before division four started, and players leave, and then you know it, it's it's it is a recur it's a, it's a recurring team, you know, and. Look, that lads might think there's more things to football as well, and especially as you come down through the grades. But just to go back to to go back to Darrell, let's say for example, you know, it's it's to, to that the fact that he's still hanging on, or not just hanging on, playing really well. What did he get turned a full forward the weekend? Full oh, forward again, yeah. Um, yeah. Like nice he's tapping goal and a rust uh, hand past the ball across, across him. him. Yeah, and, and look, he's always he's always. No, it wasn't. It was it wasn't an easy finish now. Yeah, and and he's he's he has that natural football ability all the way around there, but yeah, yeah. it's. it's I, I think there's such value in him still being in the squad. And I will I know we're kind of focused on Carlo or a bit Carlo centric here, but look, it's it's the thing we'd probably have most insight yeah, to. But yeah. I think the fact he's still in that panel, it's it's still I think I think he's holding that thing together a lot with his leadership. You know, he really is to be fair to him because he's I think he's such a good example for such a good example for the younger lads, the way he carries himself, the way he behaves, 
the way like he tell you now he's probably a better safe now than he was in his 20 like you know because it, his S&C has progressed he and that, you know? four hours down from me here now I can tell you he's, he's in super shape yeah, yeah, that's, that's good good to hear though because he's a good kid and, and funny a couple of couple of division four players uh, three actually made it into the team of the week Killian Roach Lee goalkeeper yeah, um, he's very good yeah, he's really, uh, really good. Uh, Mickey Bambrick, full back for Carlo, a lot of pace. And uh, and Dara Rooney, who's been a stalwart for Leitrim over the last couple of years, been a really, really good full forward. Uh, he's obviously he's obviously given Leitrim, you know, a, a great outlet of full forward. But lads, just quickly, probably, you know, uh looking at looking at the at the four divisions, obviously a, a few front runners, there's nothing settled yet. It'll be a long, it'll be a long national league, and there's plenty of twists and turns ahead. What is your sort of standout performance this weekend? Anybody caught the eye? Anybody that really caught the eye team wise or individual wise? Um, probably I, I thought Kevin I thought Kevin looked really sharp I know we kind of stayed there for a while yeah. for their lethargy but I thought Kevin looked really good I, just, I was just obviously only saw highlights but from what I saw they looked like they had a real purpose they looked like they were extremely well conditioned Um, they looked like they had a bit of a renewed energy like I mean Kevin we've talked about Kevin before it's been the perennial kind of up and down team in the league they'll have a, a really good year to get promoted yeah. and then you know, it, it, they'll they'll pop back down again because they probably just aren't quite at that level. But I, from what I saw, I thought they played some really nice football. I think their their management team is 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 energetic. It's young. It's it's on the pulse of things. Obviously, players have a large amount of respect respect for Galligan. I know James Burke is in the background there as well. So I thought I thought probably I thought Kevin were very impressive to be honest. Yeah, Turlock. Yeah, look, sure Monaghan's win against Dublin was yeah. for them in Cork Park. You know, yeah. they're they're the fantastic Rick Hark in some of the recent years. Um, but Tyrone to me uh, were a team that I was worried about. Uh, but I thought I saw a lot of really really good shoots. Uh, you know, for 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 uh, for this year. Yeah, like Megan McKernan. Megan McKernan slipped in that team of the week. Like, and there's a player who probably played all his football at corner back, and is now it shows the, the the evolution of players too. He's now at six. He's now a leader in that team. He's now one of the more senior players. But funny, lads, just to finish on this, lads, what what you talked about the turnover of players, too. Like, I seen an interesting thing popping up on on Twitter or something last week. The down the down list of, you know, appearances for down. I think Kevin McKernan had made 140 appearances since 2010 to last year when he retired. You know, 140. But you look at Derry, Daniel, and that Derry team, like Shane McGuigan, even though he's a young lad, he'll have 60, 70 appearances under his belt. You know, the likes of Connor Glass will have 40 or 50. And you look at the, the likes of a down team, for example, with a turnover player, some of those boys might only have 18, 19 appearances. Like, and it, it does carry a long way when you have an established group and you have a group who's playing at this level. That's, you know... It's, it's... <laughs> Success, it's, 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 it's very hard to it's very hard to, to do that slog if things aren't going well. If you don't feel there's an organisation, yeah. from management, from county board level, whatever that might be, yeah. or if if even just not winning, it's very hard being in an yeah. environment where there is like we we know we've probably seen both sides. We we're lucky to see the the good side of it for a year or two, and and we we probably saw more bad side. Absolutely, you know. Yeah. And and it's a real test of resilience. It really is. And and I I see it in school an awful lot with younger fellas resilience is an issue these days there's no doubt about it so if you're 21 or 22 and you have an option to go to australia or do whatever yeah it, it's it's life is becoming a kind of a, a bigger thing and, and it's not the end of the world for for football either it'll be it'll be fine but definitely if you're not getting some reward as regards success from your from your football uh, it's very understandable why you're we're seeing such a drop off i think absolutely yeah, yeah. but i think the yeah. thing it's you get these generations of you know coming through from time to time that where you get a really really good crop of lads come at the same time and of the same mentality and you know leadership in the group and uh they're able to hold the whole thing together when things aren't going well you know because often there are issues you know outside of the team performance even that affect the team performance and you know community relations with county boards can often be a huge issue um you know there can be stuff off the field for players and uh, these older guys, uh, you know, they're they can be fantastic role models for 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 the younger guys that are in in these teams coming through because the commitment levels are huge, and to keep going back at it, you know, week after week, year after year, when you're in Division Four, it's probably easier to manage a team in Division One than Division Four. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, like it's it's yeah. you're playing for success really up there. You're in Division Four. Yeah. You know, you're grinding out. You know, for There's pressure, as you say, if you don't win your first couple of games, yeah, a lot yeah. of pressure, you know, and, and I suppose, I suppose some of the pressure as well is probably a lot of it's unwarranted at times, too, lads. You know, a lot of it's probably unwarranted as well, you know, but uh, it's, but a, public, then it's a public thing for people, though. You know, it is, uh, especially the time of year after Christmas, first three or four league games used to be the most commented games we'd probably have all year, you know what I mean? Because everyone's mad to see with football, and yeah. you know, it's 
it's, it's tell you, I tell you, it's what's unfair on, on players is the, the, the commentary on social media by people is just shocking. Yeah. It's really shocking yeah. that's what's going on. You know, things that are said about players and management teams and county board officials, that's it's just dreadful. So it is. It's it's out yeah. of control, you know, and it really is, it definitely is a hindering factor for people. Um, you know, as bad and all as managing a county team, it must be uh, to be a county chairman or county treasurer. That's uh, in in the world that we're in at the moment. You know, with the GA, the the, the cost involved in running these county teams. Yeah, uh, everything is questioned. Everybody knows the answers to everything, but none take on the responsibility of having to raise. I reckon it's uh, the reckon it's four thousand euro to run a normal training session county book county level four thousand euro. Oh, that's some, that's some headache, lads. Per night. Yeah, yeah, per night. It's, it's, you're with you're with one of the successful teams. You know, you have big sponsors behind you. You're down in Division yeah. Four, uh, and you're playing as a dual county as we are. Um, it's a huge pressure on, on, on county board officials, and uh, they can win as a result. You know, so is this the start of the Turlock for Chairman call? Is it or what, uh, what? No, this is the start of my <laughs> call again to reform the championship so that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, here, listen, lads. On that note, we'll we'll go. But listen, thanks very much, and hopefully, see us again in, in a week's time, lads, and we can look at the shakers and movers in the first two weeks head into the break of the national league. Thanks again, man. Thank you. Yeah. See you, lads. Thanks, lads. Good luck. Take it easy.